Hello, I'm Scott Manley, and today I am going to the moon again. Now, I've done that many times before, but this time I'm doing so entirely using solid rocket motors as part of the challenge. So the mean, that means the throttle will be entirely irrelevant to this endeavor. It will just be hitting the staging button at the relevant time and steering this thing using smart ASS on mechanical jabs so that I can narrate at the same time. Now, I'm doing this... Um, not out of the challenge, or I am doing this out of the challenge, but I'm partly doing this because many people asked what happened to the real world Kerbal Space Program videos. And the truth is that many of the real world Kerbal Space Program uh, subjects were poorly documented and it was mostly me speaking over some photographs. The one that I really wanted to do was the British Interplanetary Society's speculative plan for a moon rocket which was designed in the 1930s. This would be a two-week mission to the moon uh, designed by a bunch of British eccentrics, geniuses, um, during a time when the liquid rocket had not been invented and uh, in which there was this guy called Hitler who was coming to power in Germany and <laughs> perhaps was going to interfere with their plans somewhat. But seriously, uh, you know, designing a rocket under a moon rocket under those conditions is is literally, in the most literal term, could be described as lunacy. But that didn't stop these people, and it, it featured a number of people that were, you know, really fixated with the notion of space, including some guy called Arthur C. Clarke, who, if you see the picture here, he's on the right, and you might have heard of him. He wrote a few books here and there which were quite important. Um, yeah, they were geniuses, but they were also restricted by a law in Britain that basically said, you can't build rockets. So they spent a lot of time speculating over about, thing, about things, designing stuff on paper, and they didn't have a huge amount of money either. But, um... You know, they started to look at what the ideas of the era were, and, and in 1937 there was a the film adaptation of H.G. Wells' Things to Come, and that featured people travelling to the moon in a giant cannon, and, and one of the members of the society uh, did a quick calculation and figured out that your average person would be subject to a force of about 450 tonnes. And, and he was quoted as saying, if man in the street is to be introduced to the possibility of space travel via the medium of films, especially films with as much publicity as given to things to come, it is up to the writers of them to make sure their facts are reasonably accurate. Play the game, Mr. Wells. So yeah, for about two years, from 1937 to 1939, they kind of, they, they worked on their, their notion. And their idea was a giant moon rocket, obviously powered by solid rocket motors. And the idea was that they would have a honeycomb layout of these solid rocket motors and they would pull a string and it would fire off the motor and when it was finished, the motor would automatically drop away. And these things were clustered into honeycomb kind of shaped areas. It was basically like hundreds of sticks of dynamite sitting next to each other. <clears throat> and of course, these were black powder rockets as well. This was before the modern solid rocket motors were designed. So the um, specific impulse of these uh, objects were even lower than we might imagine. So they uh, they got a lot of the stuff. Uh, <laughs> they got a lot of the stuff. Uh, well, they figured it out in their own way, I guess. In the end, their final rocket design was going to be about 100 meters high, and it was going to have about 2,250 of these um, these solid rocket motors, which would be mass produced. The rest of the rocket uh, would, would be in stacks. There would be like about six layers, I think it was, with a capsule on top. And these layers would drop away as well, lightening the load further. Um, the, the rocket itself would have to be launched from a, a lake, a platform on a lake at the equator so that nothing would catch fire. Because <laughs> they were worried about these kind of things. Now, they would fire all of these things at launch and it would accelerate through the atmosphere. And one of the things that they were concerned about was that traveling through the atmosphere at such high velocities would cause a ram pressure, would cause heat. 
And, and of course, they uh, decided, oh, yes, we need a heat shield. And so they put a heat shield on the rocket that would protect it during its travel through the atmosphere. A heat shield which was dropped after launch or after uh, it had made it into space. They didn't think that it was particularly important to protect the rocket from the pressures of re-entry. They did, of course, have a parachute, so uh, <laughs> they weren't entirely uh, crazy on this mark. I say I keep saying crazy. I, the, I gotta say, total respect for everyone involved. Uh, I I'm amazed. So uh, they didn't, of course, have the the money to build one of these things. So they they did have to design. They designed other parts of it with the money they had, and. One of the things about building a moon rocket in 1939 is that nobody had ever conceived of the computer. I mean, there had been analog computers, but, you know, those were for very specific purposes like dropping bombs and things. Very simple sets of equations. Navigating around the the solar system or the Earth-Moon system would require a human to be doing the math and taking star readings and everything. So... They would be taking their star readings and doing their calculations, but another problem on top of that was that they had no idea about the physiological problems of space travel, so they thought it was best to simulate gravity by rotating the capsule. And I don't know if you ever tried it, but keeping track of a star while you're spinning around is kind of hard. And so, with their meager budget, one of the things they did make was something called a coleostat, which was a device which included a pair of rotating mirrors and an eyepiece, and they, the pilots would essentially use this to provide a static view of the sky while they took readings of uh, the positions of objects. And then uh, the navigator would take these numbers and go back and do a lot of calculations by hand and figure out when they'd need to burn. Um, you know, the the supplies of the spacecraft actually included a large supply of coffee to make sure that the navigator was always alert when he was needed. <laughs> they, you know, they really thought about everything that they, they could at the time. They, they also included an inertial guidance system, but they, they uh, never really got around to actually building that. The Coleostat was something they actually built and is on display. And so it's actually something of a, a unique item that, that is available for viewing, apparently, at a museum somewhere. Um, so once they'd get there, they'd have to, of course, navigate to the moon's surface. Steering on this capsule would be performed by steam reaction thrusters, which uh, apparently were, were fed from a peroxide tank. And the same peroxide tank would also be used to produce water and oxygen for the crew. So uh, that way it was denser. Um, and I think that technique is used in, in other space missions, incidentally. Um, on the lunar surface, they would communicate with the Earth using light. They would essentially use Morse code using big flashes of light. And uh, But they also designed spacesuits, which are actually surprisingly close to what the Apollo mission ended up with in, in many ways. The... Uh, you know, had proper boots and, you know, visor and air pressure. They had radios for communications. Uh, but best of all, they included a dashing silver cape so that the, pilot, the astronauts could drape over themselves if they were being, you know, hit by the sun too much or whatever. <laughs> you know, you can imagine these caped uh, heroes standing on the surface of the moon fl planting the British flag. Um... So yeah, the their actual lander was significantly larger than the uh, than the Apollo lander. Obviously, they were going to stay a lot longer, and they weren't going to do a moon orbit rendezvous. But uh, you know, they uh, it was a pretty impressive design. Uh, another interesting thing was that roughly at the same time, somebody else in another British um, you know think tank or whatever. These were mostly amateurs. They had came up with a liquid-fueled rocket that was powered by gasoline or petrol, as they say. Uh, <laughs> they would say petrol, but you Americans might say gasoline. Regard regardless, they thought this was a brilliant thing, and it, it produced much more um, better specific impulse than any of their black powder rockets. But 
they figured out that to power their rockets, they would need a huge flow of fuel, and they could not conceive at the time how they could pump fuel fast enough. And that was, of course, the big problem that a guy called Werner von Braun was solving just across the channel. So yeah, they stuck with their black powder rocket designs. It's great, you know, again, those sticks of dynamite all clustered together. Um, they published it eventually, the design, in an article in uh, 1939, and apparently they were quite proud to have stolen some uh, newspaper space, a whole half page, they say, from uh, a guy called Hitler that was uh, also making waves on the other side of the English Channel. And so, yeah, they um, they published the design. Nothing came of it because World War II interfered. Um, you know, maybe if they'd been continuing to uh, refine the design, then uh, they could have done it. But I guess they turned their talents to building more useful things for the war effort. Um, apparently, incidentally, Arthur C. Clarke also tried to convince other authors of the era to, to join the society. He convinced George Bernard Shaw, who uh, joined the society at 91 years old. He also apparently approached uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, but uh, they both politely declined, regardless of how much uh, alcohol he plied them with. Anyway... That was that was uh, the British Interplanetary Society's um, moon rocket. I'm Scott Manley. See you around. Fly safe. <laughs>